Yeah, it was, <laughs> I'm standing there forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, see ya. Yeah, see ya. Good evening, everybody. We'll call the September 25th, 2017 meeting of the City of Minot Planning Commission to order. Um, those in attendance, uh, we'll call the roll, please. Arch. Here. Burning. Bullinger. Yes. Demacus. Yes. Geiner. Yes. Hanson. Yes. Carpenko. Yes. Keller. Yes. Coop. Yes. Larsius. Yes. Wegness. Yes. Wetzler. Here. Chairman Neither. Yes. Stamp the pledge, please. Pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, Commissioners, we need an approval for the August 28, 2017 minutes of the regular meeting, please. I need a motion. So moved. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Call the roll, please. March. Larger lot sizes and more traditional single family type housing. <coughs> and here is the future land use plan, and uh, it shows this as being low density residential, which will be compatible with the, the uh, zoning of R2 and the proposed use, especially compatible with the single family development. All the utilities are in. Uh, in the area, they could be extended. There is some additional right of way that's going to be needed to be dedicated on 37th Avenue to accommodate the sanitary sewer you see it as the red line at the top right of the screen. Everything else uh, was within engineering capabilities. Here's the plat, the Bluffs 8th edition. And staff recommendation is for approval. There's a developer agreement required, stormwater needs to be taken care of, sidewalks are required, connection fees, and then the additional 2 feet right away that I just mentioned to accommodate the sewer on the east side. So with that, as a summary, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for city staff, commissioners? 
Hearing none, we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, is there anybody that would like to speak on behalf of this application? Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Raleigh Ackerman from Ackerman Surveying and Associates. Uh, we agree with the uh, staff recommendations as presented. Uh, this is an infill of, of a current, uh, like Mr. Lang said, it's an infill of uh, current R2 zone, and uh, the plan from future builders is to develop uh, 23 lots uh, of single-family homes. Uh, the infrastructure is in, as, as he, as he uh, presented to you, and if there's any questions, I'd be glad to, uh, to address those. <coughs> Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to, like to speak in favor of this, op or, I'm sorry, in favor of this application? Seeing none, would anybody like to speak in opposition of this application? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and uh, turn it over to the Commissioners for a motion, please. Got a motion on the floor? Second. And a second. Any discussion, commissioners? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Barge? Yes. Bullinger? Yes. Demacus? Abstain. Geiner? <coughs> Hansen? Yes. Carpenko? Yes. Keller? Yes. Coop? Yes. Larsis? Yes. Neither? Abstain. Wigness? Yes. Witzler? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Off to agenda item number three. Um, this is an application by Jeff and Betty Gerhardt, um, located at 4199 13th Street Northwest, Lot 9, um, for a, um, I'm sorry, at Cedar Mountain Townhomes, 4th edition, and rezoning uh, R3B to R3C. Uh, turn it over to city staff for comments, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, here's a vicinity map that shows the location of this uh, structure. It was originally built as a duplex. You'll notice it's all on one lot, both sides of it. And if you look uh, to the adjacent, up towards the uh, up, up towards the left side of the going up this the street uh, to the north, you'll notice that those units look very similar. But there's a lot lying down the middle, and each side is on its own lot. And that's what the applicant is wanting to do here is uh, to make this townhouse into a, uh, private, I'm sorry, this duplex into a townhouse. So here's the subdivision, uh, lot 1A and lot 1B, the existing structure will be split down the common firewall. Uh, there is some work that needs to be done to achieve that. The building inspection department's gone out and taken a look at the existing construction. And I talked to one of the inspectors today and Saturday the drywaller started working and they were anticipating being done today or tomorrow. So when they get done, they'll have to call for a final inspection. And if that's approved, then uh, that firewall issue will be taken care of. Here's a orth kind of an orthotic aerial view. From a neighbor's standpoint, nothing really changes. The structure still looks the same. And nothing's being added to the outside or anything like that. There's also a rezoning associated with this. It's uh, an R3B zone, which is one of the defunct <laughs> zones that were done away with, done away with in 2013. And uh, city staff asked the applicant if they'd be willing to, to zone this R3C, which is a, a valid zone, and it's the townhouse zone, uh, and they agreed to do that. So the rezoning is from R3B to R3C. We still have the same issue on both sides with it being R3B, but we can only do you know one step at a time to get some of these zoning issues fixed. And here you see the future land use map, medium density residential, which either as a duplex or uh, especially as a townhouse, if this would fit. So the staff <coughs> recommendation is for approval. And the uh, only condition is the having to do with the common firewall that I, I mentioned a minute ago has to be upgraded to meet fire rating standards. And they're in the process of doing that. As soon as the final inspection is approved, then uh, the building department will let us know. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Any questions for city staff, staff commissioners? 
Seeing none, would anybody like to speak in favor of this application? Mr. Chairman, on behalf of uh, Jeff and Betsy Gerhardt, uh, if you've got any questions uh, of them, I'd be glad to, glad to answer that. But, uh, simply uh, just as stated, it was an original duplex on a single lot, and uh, they are in the process of making it a, a, a twin home. There's no problems with the condition set forth by city staff? Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Ackerman? Seeing none, would anybody like to speak in opposition of this application? Seeing none, we'll close the comment period and turn it over to the commissioners for a motion, please. Move to approve with the staff recommendation. I have a motion on the floor. Okay. And the second. Any more discussion, commissioners? Call the roll, please. Barch? Yes. Bullinger? Yes. Demacus? Yes. Geiner? Yes. Hansen? Yes. Carpenko? Yes. Keller? Yes. Coop? Yes. Larsius? Yes. Wagness? Wetzler? Yes. Chairman Neither. Yes. Motion carried. Um, off to item agenda number four. This is an application by Stacy Abel uh, to request approval to create an outlot plat for single rural residential lot in the two mile jurisdiction, um, as well as to rezone from AG to RA. Um, please turn it over to uh, city staff for comment, please. This is an outlot subdivision and rezoning, as the chairman said. Uh, this is the vicinity map here. It's in the southeast part of town. The, the solid uh, or the broad uh, yellow line on the, uh, on the left side of the screen is, is Highway 83. And so the subject property is uh, about a mile and a half what, or east of, uh, of Highway 83. The existing zoning is, is the blue zoning, which is uh, agricultural. Uh, agricultural zones require at least 20 acres, and this is only 9.50 acres. So. Uh, the proposal is to rezone the property to RA, Agricultural Residential, which has a two acre minimum lot size, allows well and septics, and this is certainly uh, exceeds that at nine and a half acres. Here's kind of a orthotic aerial view that shows more of the area. At this time, it's uh, very rural in nature. The, uh, there's a riding stable to the east that you may be familiar with, and uh, the, the roadway kind of drops off to the right to the east down into the <coughs> valley. There's uh, scattering residence, uh, residences along this road on the north and the south back towards Broadway. This is the plat itself. So the 9.50 acre site. It's the original homestead that's being split off from the balance of what is known as, some people might know as the Galusha property. There is a road right away to be dedicated both along County Road 14A, which is 54th, and also on the west side of the site, there's 40 feet of right-of-way to be dedicated. There's an existing 40 feet of right-of-way to the west of that. So you'll see a total of 80 feet of right-of-way proposed along the west property line. You can see where those right-of-way lines on both sides, on the east that splits one of the outbuildings and there's a great bend that will have to be removed. And on the west, it uh, affects the neighbor's property, goes through, the, through their garage. This is a future land use map, and interest, interestingly enough, it shows neighborhood commercial is the pink and medium density is the orange. Uh, seems to me and to staff, when we look at this and, and how rural it is, that this is a very long range projection for, for what might be there someday. And it strikes us as odd that the, the, uh, the proposed commercial isn't even centered on the intersection, but this is, is what the future land use map shows. And you'll see a couple of labels there that say phase four and phase five. And then to the north, you'll see phase one. Uh, that's talking about urban growth tiers. In other words, priorities of growth with phase one being the most immediate and phase <coughs> five, or there may be a six phase two, but phase five being uh, on down the line in, in the future when uh, other uh, utilities and changes are come in place. But You'll notice at the top left corner, the squared off red line is the city limit line and the wider <coughs> red line that kind of loops through there is a sanitary sewer trunk line that was installed a few years ago and it continues to be under construction going further east and it's going to open <coughs> this area up for future development uh, in the future, uh, probably the low density and very low density residential that's shown may be reconsidered 
with the comp plan update to increase the density to take advantage of and recoup the cost of that sanitary sewer line. This again is that collector road. It shows it coming through on an alignment with the 80 <coughs> feet of right away that's dedicated on the west side of the parcel. You also notice 13th Street is uh, shown uh, being extended someday uh, from its terminus further north through this area. There's a lot of topography and some challenges there, but that's also part of the plan. This is a blown up picture, I guess, of the the west side of the site and it shows the impact to the neighboring property owner to the to the west those folks have been in and visited and i think that you have a letter too or i know that you do because i we passed out uh from from the uh people that live to the west about the impact the right away might have on on their property uh as i explained to this then this is a paper street at this time but when development happens then the roadway will be constructed so staff recommendations for approval. Uh, the uh, access points must be approved by the Ward County Highway Department, and I know that uh, the data with the, the, the Highway Department's been involved with the planning of this. So if you have any questions, you might have. Commissioners, any questions for city staff at this time? Seeing none, we'll open the comment period. And uh, would anybody like to speak in favor of this application? Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, uh, as Mr. Lang had stated, this is the Bernice Lucy Estate property, and uh, uh, we have met with uh, uh, Dana Larson, the county engineer, uh, probably at least three times, uh, a couple different meetings, both on site and, and uh, at our office, and uh, uh, followed uh, their recommendations as far as uh, road alignments and so on. Um, if there's concerns on the on the west side, uh, we, we had talked about that too. Uh, within that 80 foot right away, we certainly can shift that road as necessary so there would not be any impact on the folks to the west. Uh, that was a thing that uh, uh, Mr. Abel was pretty definite about that uh, there is no impact on the neighbors and we certainly can get that within that corridor by shifting that, uh, the road within the right of way, because we have 80 foot right of way and that's more than enough to uh, uh, not impact those folks. Uh, that 40 foot uh, uh, strip on the, on the west side has been there uh, long before, uh, that was platted actually as part of that original lot lot. Uh, so we, I mean that, that 40 foot strip has, has been there as long as the lot lot was uh, started or, or done originally. <coughs> um, so if there's any questions, uh, we are dedicating additional right away on the south side for uh, a, re a realignment. Uh, Mr. Lang, can you bring that one photo up? Uh, Where you uh, go? The, the one going that shows, go back. that one right there. On the, on the southeast corner, in the southeast corner, if you look in your packet, uh, you'll see a center line alignment on there. Anyway, it's, a, it's right in the south, southwest corner. I don't know what you're doing. South, southwest corner, you'll see a center line alignment. And that's the new center line alignment. And you can see the existing road. Um, as it as it stands, and uh, uh, the county engineer uh, wanted us to dedicate additional right of way. So if there is some uh, some future realignment there, to make that curve so it isn't so sharp that we dedicate that property now, and that's what we've done. Uh, Mr. Abel has uh, agreed to do that. So if there's any questions about this or anything that I can answer, I'd be glad to. Any questions for the applicant? Commissioners? Mr. Chair, just. Yep, yeah, uh, Mr. I just want to make clear. So, you agreed that you could shift that right away <coughs> more onto Mr. Abel's property so that it does not affect the property owners to the west? We right? can shift the road within the right of way. 
Yes, because there's 80 foot right away there. And, and in that case, right in there, um, there wouldn't be a problem, according to county engineer, by shifting that road slightly to the, to the east to avoid any conflict with the neighbors. And that's my direction for Mr. Abel, Mr. Abel as well. Any other questions, commissioners? Seeing none, would anybody else like to speak in favor of this application? Seeing none, would anybody like to speak in opposition of this application? place but they were unable to make it so I was just came to represent I actually really don't have we don't have an opposition to the zone change we just more had concerns for future use of our land so which he kind of answered actually in his statement with um, access to our back garage because that was one of our concerns was if a road was going to be put there because that's the intent with the development that will be going back there we were just concerned about kind of access to the back of our property as you can see there the garage there and whatnot and there tends to be a lot of snow that gets in the back there, so we're kind of worried about snow removal and where all that would go. And also, uh, sorry, um, also kind of privacy, since you know we live out of town and just like privacy, there would be a lot more traffic that would go that way, so just privacy concerns. So just wanted to touch base because we weren't sure with um, notification on the future, since it didn't look like we'd be within that 300 foot margin so we just kind of want to make sure to touch base with our concerns tonight but if you have any questions but other than that no opposition to the zone change though just any questions commissioners perfect thank you, thank you very much appreciate it would anybody like uh, from the city like to speak as far as the snow snow removal or any of that would that be handled by the county i assume What uh, we talked about is that this will probably be, in, in a lot of the rural subdivisions now, the county and the township are, are going to uh, probably go to an HOA. Uh, there'll be some kind of agreement between the, the township and the, the property owners as far as some kind of joint agreement there to do that. Um, his intent is, is to, um, uh, after a year or so, is to uh, hard surface that, that, uh, that area. Uh, but that's something in the future of whatever he does with the property to the north. So um, there again, he certainly a, certainly intends to be a good neighbor to the folks to the west. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Yeah. Would anybody else like to speak on behalf of this application? Seeing none, we'll turn it over to commissioners for a motion, please. Make a motion to approve with the staff recommendation in adding a condition where the road be properly placed further east to not impact the current resident to west. Got a motion on the floor? And a second. Any discussion, commissioners? I guess my only comment would be, um, you know, I understand uh, it, not necessarily the opposition, but um, um, I guess the concern about where the roadway may lay. And um, one of my concerns is that if the Ward County feels that that road needs to be placed on the section line or on the property line, I don't know if um, I don't know if we want to we want to be deviating from that. But just my comments. Any other comments from uh, commissioners? Okay. Call the roll, please. Barge. Yes. Bollinger. Yes. Demacus. Yes. Geiner. Yes. Hansen. Yes. Carpenko. Keller? Coop? Yes. Larchus? Yes. Wagness? Yes. Wetzler? Yes. Chairman Neither? Yes. Motion carried. Off to our next agenda item is Pardon me. Agenda item number five. This is an application by Northridge Villas LLC. Um, this is a, an application that's coming back to us 
for a replat or an outlet plat depicting two outlots in association with the Northridge Village Development House, <coughs> uh, known as the Peterson Greenway. Uh, with that, turn it over to city staff for comments, please. Yes, sir. There's the vicinity map uh, along the west bypass. Uh, that would be uh, east of the bypass and west of 27th Street, northwest. Uh, this outlaw plat that you're going to see today, let me move forward here. The outlaw plat is, it goes back and ties into the Northridge uh, Villas development uh, a few months ago. The Northridge team came in with a proposal to subdivide and uh, rezone the property that's shown in yellow, which is Northridge Villas. The plat was Northridge Villas second, and the zoning was uh, PUD uh, to R2, R2 PUD. And as part of that presentation, uh, both for the PUD to provide open space and because of the Minot Park District's policy that subdivisions provide open space or money in lieu of dedication of land, uh, the Peterson Greenway concept was presented. And the green area that's shown here that's quite extensive uh, is the Peterson Greenway, and it's just shy of, of 17 acres. And at the time that the PUD and the subdivision for Northridge Villa Second were approved, condition for both was that that Peterson Greenway be dedicated. And I want you to understand this is uh, way above what would be required as a minimum for the code. And Mr. Zimmerman and his uh, his uh, team have been uh, working on on uh, acquiring this land. The condition was that it be dedicated to the park district before all the, the plats are filed and whatnot. And so he's been working diligently with the, the current owners, has a purchase agreement, there is a, a dedication agreement that's in draft form and issues are being uh, negotiated with the park district attorney and the park district personnel. And um, let me move forward here. Here's a, another uh, rendition that shows in the light <coughs> blue the uh, Peterson Greenway outlaw. There's a lot of moving parts to this. When uh, Mr. Zimmerman went to put together a purchase agreement to get a description of the property that would actually be Peterson Greenway, which was a conglomeration of outlaws at the time, the recorder's office wouldn't accept whatever uh, could be found. So Houston Engineering did a, a, a new plat, did a survey of the property, and did an outlaw plat that describes by meets and bounds this outlot area. And it's shown on here as outlot 11 in the blue. That is Peterson Greenway that would be dedicated to the park district. There's also uh, another outlet shown in green, which is outlot 12. And that's caused some concerns from staff because it's a landlocked parcel. Um, this is another picture of the Greenway. I'm sorry, let me back up. So the best picture that we have here about outlot 12 is right there. So we have this uh, landlocked outlot, or landlocked outlot, and the subdivision regulations say that all lots have to have at least one lot abutting the street other than an alley. And since Northridge Villa second edition has already been through approval and waiting for the PUD before it can be filed, it would be required to revise that plat to add the outlot into it, so that's not part of that. And it's shown as part of this outlot, but it's landlocked. And so, as uh, city staff was grappling with this, we came up with a solution that maybe doesn't meet the full letter of uh, the intent of the statement about the buddy of the street, but it, I think it's a compromise that, that we would present to the Planning Commission as a solution to this outlot 12. That would be the 15-foot access easement be planted across one of the Northridge Villa second lots or lots, <coughs> either 15 feet on one lot or seven and a half on each side of a common lot line that would connect through to the outlot. That would be done by separate instrument by an attorney or surveyor and filed a record so it wouldn't be shown on either plat, but the plats would be referenced. And it would be for the use and enjoyment of Northridge Villa second owners. And <coughs> because it only had a 15, it would only have a 15 foot access to it. Be restricted to not habitable structures, typical of open space and parks type uses, uh, walking trails, gardens, benches, and picnic tables, perhaps a playground, that kind of thing. We couldn't come up with any better solution 
uh, other than to add the two outlaws together and dedicate them as parks, which the owners don't want to do, or to revise Northridge Villa second and add the plat in, which uh, which apparently uh, isn't an option to them either. So um, with that as an explanation, I hope I didn't confuse you too much, but that's uh, the issue that, that we're running into is how to deal with this outlaw 12. Outlaw 11 is, is what uh, was presented for the Peterson Greenway, and that is what's going to be dedicated to any questions for city staff? One quick question: Is uh, the, the park board okay with just accepting L lot eleven? To my knowledge, uh, I think they're working through some, you know, some some issues. Of, or when when it was presented before, there was a, a trail easement that was shown that the owners were going to participate in and build that trail with timing and some of those kind of things and other amenities. There was a landscape plan, so. I really haven't been privy to those uh, conversations that I can't say, but Ron Merritt did tell me they were working towards finalizing it. Okay. Lastly, did anybody reach out to the city recorder at the, at the city level, or the county recorder at the city level, to see if uh, that plan could be recorded as, as proposed? Did not. Thank you. Um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on behalf of this application? Mr. Chairman, member of the Planning Commission, uh, I'm John Hall, I'm here representing Northridge Villa on this plat application, which is uh, essentially strictly limited to what we're trying to do to satisfy, we think, uh, hopefully above and beyond, uh, the requirement for uh, the land dedication instead of doing just a straight monetary dedication. I'd like to address some of the points, and then Donna Bai, our planning assistant from Houston Engineering, will have a comment on a couple of these slides, too. and then. When we're done with these, <clears throat> we're happy to take any questions uh, from the commissioners, uh, and we'll go from there and uh, be available again uh, if, if necessary. So uh, just going ahead here, um, it's our understanding uh, we've received late in the day a copy of a protest letter, a letter from the neighbor, and I just wanted to address a couple of those points initially because some of its ground we've gone over before, uh, but there are new commissioners and such, and we'd like to be uh, forthright in addressing some of those comments, and we can certainly ask or answer questions related to them. But regarding some of the uh, items in the protest letter, uh, the landscaping and standstill status, uh, with the delay and the ultimate approval, hopefully, of the rezone, we initially held off because if you recall, we initially were planning on being in the April Planning Commission meeting, the May City Council meeting for the first vote on the rezone. That got pushed back to June, and then there was obviously the changeover in the City Council and such, and then during that first vote, the conversation from the council was, uh, there were a couple of council uh, members that said uh, they weren't entirely comfortable with the fact that we had a recorded trail <coughs> in place, but that we didn't own that land. So then it took us going back uh, and tracking down the landowner who spends most of the year in Arizona, some of the year at the lake up here in North Dakota. And then once we started that process and working with Houston Engineering, as Mr. Lang noted, uh, we realized that there were conflicting legal descriptions of the, the land in question that we wanted to acquire for the uh, Greenway. As such, we, uh, under our own uh, cost, brought Houston on board to do that survey, which Mr. Lang uh, referenced, to uh, properly and legally define that, take that to the county to get the designation of the two proposed outlaws that we're bringing before you tonight, uh, and get in place the uh, purchase and sale agreement uh, with the existing owner and move that process along because we do need a recorded plat before we can finalize that transaction with the current owner, which then will help facilitate the land dedication agreement that's in, in process with the uh, park district, which I'm happy to discuss a little bit more. But just to address a couple of the comments in the protest letter, so with that in mind, our intent was to do landscaping this year as the drought evolved and as the delay in the rezone process evolved. <coughs> we decided, uh, made a conscious decision to hold off on any landscaping uh, until next year, uh, just based on that fact, and we didn't want to spend hundreds of dollars a month. As many residents took that decision if you drove around town during the height of the drought. Uh, and then, as we noted um, in a fact sheet that we provided to the neighbors during the three neighborhood meetings that took place in April and early May of this year, uh, we actually, 
as a group and hibernating the, the development based on the slowdown in the housing market here in Minot and trying to figure out what was the best product mix, we actually waited until, we're waiting until we have some zoning clarity regarding our application, um, some finality on that before we actually list the model house. So we, never, we as a group have not put that on the market. That said, we have a, a doctor who's moved up here from Iowa who's interested in it, who's seen the outside um, that we're showing the house to this weekend. So we've, we're probably going to get off that pause button <laughs> with respect to the existing model house there. But I did want to address the landscaping situation and the standstill there. Uh, there are some dead trees on the boulevard there that never came back. We will take care of those. They're not a nuisance to anybody. Uh, and the other uh, two dead pine trees that are on the lots down below, uh, i just like to remind the commission, we will get those removed, but at the same time, that whole entire area of Northridge is private property. We've provided open access to the neighbors who walk their dogs, they bike down there, they skateboard down there and such. And so, yes, they see them when they're down there, but only because we've not restricted access to our private property there. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Schmaltz made a comment about we don't need a green space. I'd like to argue to you that the connectivity that this will provide to the existing trail system to the neighbors to the northwest there is a very compelling proposition. And while it might not appeal to her, I think that you as a uh, planning commissioner is thinking about the greater good for Minot as well as hopefully the city council will see the greater good in what we're trying to accomplish here. And the other thing that's honestly been uh, quite frustrating and I'll start at the third point here. Uh, there was point, there are points made in the letter regarding we're just you know hit and run carpet baggers and this and that. As I've said before, I'm a minded native. We've stuck with this project. We've hibernated it. It's cost money. We've spent money on the upkeep. Um, as we've carried this along to try to find the right product that will work in the market, and we've stayed committed to it. And versus selling it off and creating a similar, albeit on a smaller scale, willy nilly development that the neighborhood went through. Uh, with the Eagles Landing development during the height of the boom. So our thought has been a comprehensive, cohesive plan here that creates a unique pocket neighborhood within Minot that will definitely be appreciative to their, uh, not only the aesthetics of the neighborhood, but also their value <coughs> of the property. Um, the other two points I'd make here is that the other frustration has been, in the past there have been fabricated, unsubstantiated comments regarding our planning uh, assistant, Ms. By when the neighbor, the this, this same uh, person asserted that her husband was an investor in the project and that Ms. Bai's only motivation for creating the PUD uh, zoning option was to help our project, which was later you know, accepted by them and they issued a formal apology to the, commission, or the council for essentially fabricating that. And then also there were neighbors that were in support of our proposal for the R2 rezone that shifted their support. When we went back to them, they explained that people submitting the petition had told them that if the split villas, which is our description of the joined, but the, well, the twin units that are detached from others, wasn't successful, we could just go ahead and start building apartment buildings in there, which is untrue, which we explained in our fact sheet, which is not an option. We can only do single family. We can only do these detached, detached uh, split villas. And we told those neighbors about that. They reinstated their support for the project. So I'm just saying there's a grain of salt, I think, that's involved here. Now the other thing is that you saw some pictures of the grass that wasn't cut, if you will, in front of the model. I explained why we haven't uh, done the landscaping there yet, but I'd also like to point out that the neighbor at 713 27th Street built a fire pit this year in their backyard, and when they started constructing that, it was after the initial vote, and Councilman Dave Shimento got calls from the neighbor thinking that we were building something back there, which we clearly told them it wasn't ours, but uh, in the spirit of being good neighbors, we've had a trash pile from the, uh, uh, from the construction of that on our property since June. I'm in the process of putting together uh, a certified letter to this neighbor just asking for the polite removal of this since it's been three months since they constructed that fire pit back there. So I'm just saying there's a little give and take here. We've tried to be good neighbors. We've spent thousands of dollars a year this, this year alone just keeping the property mowed. Um, does it get to eight and a half inches maybe? Um, obviously with the drought, it was a little irregular this year. So. These are some pictures from about a week ago. Property's been mowed. We'll probably mow it again now that we've had rain. So just to talk at a higher level regarding the letter that you've seen that we really didn't get uh, very early in the process today. So going back to uh, the comments from Mr. Lang, just again, a quick overview here. This is a very rough depiction. You saw a more accurate one, if you will, a more precise one uh, in the presentation. But you can see the, the fine green line there, which is essentially the trail system, and as noted, uh, to your question, Chairman, neither 
Uh, in our meetings with uh, Park District staff, they're fully aware of our petition for these two outlots. It actually falls on this roughly 1.1 acres we're asking for outlot 12 to be not part of the dedication, falls on the other side, on the east side of the drainage ditch that ultimately runs into the collection pond there, the storm water detention pond, which is for Eagles Landing, not for our project. Uh, and they are completely fine because it doesn't interfere with the proposed trail system that we are you know, intending to build there. Uh, and uh, it's not relevant to what the, what the uh, uh, park district requires. And in fact, as noted earlier, uh, the acreage requirement for our dedication, if we were to dedicate acreage, would be 2.16 acres. And our intent is to dedicate nearly 17 acres uh, to the park district, assuming this transaction gets completed. And this is just a little close up thing here. Uh, the park district and our negotiations with them are fine. With the Peterson Greenway designation, the intent <coughs> there is for the homesteading family in which we're gonna provide a plaque on the uh, Greenway uh, to be noted as the, you know, the name of it, the park district's fine with that. So our reference to it as the Peterson Greenway is consistent with what the park expects and what the park uh, finds acceptable. And within that uh, agreement that's developing, we're waiting for the turn on the draft from the uh, council for the park district. It will have all the details, the requirements that we would have to meet to meet the initial construction of the trail system per the park requirements. And again, as uh, presented to the count, uh, commission before, um, this, will, this will trail will initially have that continuity to the Woodland Trail, which is down just off the bypass south of, the 83 bypass just south of the Suris River near, just west of Suris uh, Valley Golf Course. So this is, the, the view on the right is essentially from 27th Avenue, which would be the entry point provided for that entire neighborhood up there. And just to kind of put it into perspective, we got a list from the park district of existing parks and green spaces and facilities. And as proposed, the Peterson Greenway would immediately become a very impactful part of the trail system and tie into a very significant part of the city. Um, and then just to kind of, uh, the bison plant is by far the largest, but obviously that's not as convenient to a lot of residents as as this trail system would be. And uh, just to note that there are other facilities, the things that we didn't include on that list were Surs Valley Golf Course and things like that, but just to put it in perspective on the impact of the green, this green space relative to the size of the existing green space is very significant, and as noted, it's roughly eight times what the requirement is on an acreage basis on what we're expected to uh, donate with respect to our PUD rezone request. I'm just gonna have Ms. By come up here and make a couple comments regarding some existing outlaws and the fact that this might not seem as uh, off market a request as uh, as it might. Um, thank you. My name is Donna Bai. I uh, used to work for the city and the planning division. Um, here tonight representing um, Redbridge Villas um, and John Zimmerman's team. I've been on that team since the end of January of this year. Um, Tyler, you asked a question about the Clark County Recorder earlier, and, and I guess before I forget that, I'd like to address that. One of the things that um, I do as a consultant in, in the planning um, division here is that we work closely with all of the agencies that are affecting or affected by the request that we're making here today. So I've um, gotten to know the Ward County uh, Recorder's Office, um, their appraisal, um, Ward County Tax, uh, a couple of other different offices over there and so as we've created these two outlets that you have before you tonight we've um, made sure that between them and the city that we are meeting the requirements um, that they're getting a chance to look at those uh, in digital form in paper form um, final uh, recorded documents come on mylar they come from our office in fargo with the signature of our civil or one of our um, surveyors there so to prevent any time delays and, and redos of, of mailings and, and shipping and, and timing, we decided to get early um, in this game uh, opinions from, from their office. And, and we verified um, over the weekend, um, or maybe the email was in this morning's email box, but that um, both um, an individual that we're working with, the county recorder's office, and the county recorder herself uh, reviewed those plats and, and didn't have um, a regulation or a reason that they would not be able to record those documents based on um, the property not touching a public right away. 
Um, that portion of the ordinance was in place in 2001 when I began my job as the city planner. Oftentimes, um, it made sense to, to utilize that on a straight up um, creation of a lot uh, with a public right away or a neighborhood, uh, whether that's um, commercial or, or residential in nature. Um, but the PUD was that tool, um, and in using that toolbox, we open that up and say, there are things that require different um, needs, different allowances, <coughs> different approval processes. And we were finding in the last couple of years when we had all of these new developers and contractors coming through our doors in, in all the departments of the city that we were still operating on 30 years ago. And, and whether it was the, the principle of it or whether it was um, the formats or, or whatever it was that we needed to get um, into this next century. And so we begged the council for the money to upgrade those zoning ordinances. Um, and in turn, we needed to update our comprehensive plan. And so we were guided through that process that took many years, and many of you were part of that, um, time and effort. But it, it really was determined that there was a mechanism that was needed. And so the PUD was created as a chapter. And in my final um, months with the city, um, <laughs> there we struggled. We struggled to understand what a PUD was. We struggled to to educate the public and the elected and, and appointed officials on what that does. And I think John and, and NRV's project here has really given that from start to finish um, open eye of what a PUD can do and what it's meant for. And so when you talk about a piece of property in the middle of um, the area that we are in today, um, this area is, is cleaning up the final piece on the east side of that right away there. The final piece that everyone has left to, for someone else to deal with, whether it was um, somebody's um, dumping hole, whether it was somebody's campfire after prom, whether it was um, a place to get in trouble, whether it was a place to um, bird watch, whether, whatever it was, um, the, the piece of land has been neglected for many years. And this is, um, could certainly go the opposite way. This could be a nuisance, this could be a, you know, a community um, trying to fix this problem instead of trying to make it an amenity that it is. And so when we look at um, what that lot ends up representing, it shouldn't be looked at as a lot because it's not touching right away, we shouldn't approve it. We're talking about a lot that in the future will become something better than it is today. It doesn't need a roadway built to it, dedicated, whether it's on paper or, or actually constructed. It's a lot that has a purpose that has not been entirely defined today, but it will be an amenity to both the green space and the neighbors of that um, development. Um, so we ask that you look at the PUD, the exceptions that the PUD allows, and, and approve this project for, for what its future use is. Um, this item in front of you was a project that was approved um, a number of years ago. It has a similar challenge, that there was one small piece you can see by the driveway along 16th Avenue Southwest. Um, it's near, uh, just west of Our Lady of Grace Church. Try to make some room here for myself. Um, right down in here. And it had one way in and only one way in. And it has some terrain to it. Um, it has some access challenges. Um, it is uh, not a road that was able to be dedicated at 66 feet wide. So it was given a private road um, designation. And it has a number of higher end homes back in here, tucked in, very unique, small niche neighborhood. But it f was previously part of a junkyard 30, 40 years ago that was associated with this big lot here. Um, there was some overgrowth, some trees, there was some drainage issues, all of that fixed and improved for not just the people that live in this small part, but for a lot of the people that um, are adjacent to it. Um, this is one that you've seen in the past. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, this is the bluffs, same thing. You have a number of lots that are attached to a private drive. Um, the Planning Commission City of Council have, have ruled that this is an acceptable means of development. 
Um, another one that I didn't have time to drop into um, today was um, Skyport. Uh, a developer named Joel Feist, um, right after the flood, started developing property up on 30th Avenue. Um, you have some townhouse units up there. Um, they're two-story uh, with a garden-level basement, um, both on the north end and on the south end with some um, alleyways and some private drives within there as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to John. In reviewing the uh, staff recommendations, we, we have a request to to amend that that recommendation for approval with the, the staff list of two conditions. And what we would like to request this evening of the Planning Commission is an amended uh, first condition to read as follows. Alt lot 11, as shown <coughs> described in its entirety on the alt lot plan, will be dedicated to the Minot Park District by a separate mutually agreed to park dedication agreement executed between Northridge Villas and the Park District. And the reason for this simplification, simplification of this first condition, um, the two key points here are there's some unnecessary and redundant points in the current staff recommendation. First of all, the Minot Park District, in our discussions with them, with council present, does not require the recording of a final <coughs> park dedication agreement, uh, which we would expect would apply to us as well. So the standard operating procedure for the Park District is to not record these dedication agreements they keep them on file at the park, park District and then between the other parties. They are legally binding, but they're not a recorded document. Um, and then regarding the, uh, the, the comment from staff uh, regarding the submission of an updated uh, purchase agreement with the <coughs> corrected legal description from Outlot 11, our purchase agreement with the existing owner, uh, in a sense, is a, is a catch-all for the land that is mutually uh, expected to be dedicated ultimately to the park district, the outlot 11 portion of it. Uh, and we'll, we'll obviously, with the plat, we needed the new survey, which we paid for ourselves, to ultimately get the plat, plat to come before you this evening and then before the city council, uh, before we can execute that agreement. And that sets in the chain of events where we're able to dedicate that land to the park district. But we can't execute that purchase agreement with the uh, current owner until we have a newly recorded plat, which obviously is why we're before you this evening. So um, in our opinion, there's no reason for an updated purchase agreement uh, based on the fact that the warranty deed associated with any transaction closing that existing purchase agreement will have the newly updated plats as determined by the work that Houston Engineering did. Um, <clears throat> secondly, our request is that condition two be deleted in its entirety. As Donna alluded to, um, our goal here is to uh, create clarity, which we've done um, out of a large tract of land. Um, the, the portion that we're looking to keep the roughly 1.1 acres with Northridge, we're not looking for a zone change right now. We're not looking to do anything extensive with it. We're just trying to create this clarity so that we can execute the park dedication agreement as part of the other chain of events and conditions for our PUD rezone application prior to a second consideration from the city council. So in this sense, what we're just saying is that we understand there's conditions. If we've tried to do something with it, we, you know, in effect agree that um, it is a piece of land that is there. It's separate from what the park needs. And as discussed earlier, the park does not need this one, uh, one acre tract. It's separated by the drainage. Uh, the trail system will be to the west of this tract. So there's no effect on the plans for that. And quite frankly, we don't have a crystal ball exactly how that might be used. Our expectation would be that it'd be likely don't, uh, dedicated or transferred mm -hmm. over to the HOA at some point. But to say that we need to have that easement now, uh, we need this, that, and the other thing just seems unreasonable to us because we may get to the point where uh, if this is approved, uh, we might find that people that are interested in those tracks say, hey, let's split that and have extra big backyards on this, this track. Um, we already have a, a, an easement from the southwest corner and as part of our dedication agreement with the park, we will have the ability for Northridge to pay for and build an access point uh, to the trail system out of that south southwest corner of the development. So we don't necessarily need that for trail access. Um, and so at this point in time, again, without having a crystal ball, we would like just to set aside Condition 2 entirely because our view is that um, it's essentially property that we would like to retain. We're going 8x the requirement for the 2.16 acres for the park dedication in association with the PUD application. Uh, and we'd like to simplify the first condition to read as follows for the reasons I mentioned. And with that, I'll conclude our comments and take any questions from the commission. Any questions, commissioners? Any questions? 
I, I just do have a couple maybe maybe comments. I, I don't think there's any uh, disagreement that Outlot 11 fulfills, I mean, what the city of Minot's envisionment for a PUD was, and it goes above and beyond. That's no question. I guess my, my only concern is, is earlier in my career, maybe 10 years ago, I ran across the same problem where we had an outlot um, within the, uh, the county of Ward that um, unfortunately was landlocked, and we, we had problems um, getting, getting that recorded. I also called down to the recorder's office, and maybe something's changed where your engineer sp spoke to the uh, Ward County recorder, but um, in my conversations they had some, some concerns about uh, recording a landlocked parcel of land. Now, uh, in my dealings with, uh, uh, I guess, county offices across the state, I know that uh, each county office differs. So one thing I, that I, I don't want to see happen is, uh, should we remove uh, that condition for Outlaw 12, and we go through uh, this, this uh, commission, and two more readings of city council, that puts us off a couple more months, and then uh, we're back in the same position where we have, to, we have to do something. So as long as you guys have done your research uh, that uh, Outlaw 12 can be recorded and it is land like a parcel, um, I guess we'll have to see how this commission decides to put a motion forward. Chairman, um, either, I, I guess I would just, just to reiterate what Don had said earlier, she had confirmed with the county office that, you know, assuming it has the proper city sign-offs, whether it's the park board, us, the city engineer, um, that they will record this track. They specifically said that, are the two outlaws. So they expressed no reason not to do that. Um, we can certainly provide the backup on that. But that was, that was very clear to us. And I think that, um, I hear where you're coming from, and I think Donna made a very good point of part of our ancillary goal here, obviously we have the primary goal related to the PUD because it was clear from the council that having the recorded trail easement in place wasn't sufficient for them. So therefore we pursued the owner and put the purchase agreement in place, did all the boundary surveys and created these plats. Uh, and thought about where we, you know, there was a, um, our, in, in looking back at the history of this during the chaotic period, there was uh, an initial verbal intent to include what's outlawed 11, 12, excuse me, in the original Northridge subdivision. It kind of got overlooked by the surveyors back then. Um, our, our comment there would be is that, is that um, our, our group owns uh, the land that's on Northridge Villas right now. We, uh, we would also obviously own these two outlots if the plats are approved and those, that transaction goes through and then obviously we dedicate all of outlot 11 to the park district, but that there would be obviously a sort of a unique association there. We know that it wouldn't be marketable, marketable based on the landlocked nature of it, but what we might find <clears throat> a year or two down the road is that it's very, uh, it, it could be used to create a very enticing amenity for the project that we're doing in Northridge, uh, or it might be something where Two people, you know, are interested in splitting that and having much bigger lots than everybody else in Northridge. But we're fully aware of the fact that um, that that would be a um, uh, an uphill road uh, to climb just based <coughs> on that landlocked nature. So we don't really have any high expectations that you know, or we understand the regulations that don't prevent or per permit uh, something to be built back there with respect to like another single-family house or anything as it is now. So our view there and the request for getting condition two removed is just to have some flexibility down the road, but understanding there are very tight guide rails with respect to the city ordinances and how city staff and likely this commission and the council would view any sort of potential rezone or change of status uh, for that tract of land. I think that's one of the city's positions as well as um, not necessarily yourself, but any other developer, um, if, if they do have a landlocked parcel, and just go to an attorney's office and record a deed and try to sell to somebody. They have an unmarketable piece of ground that uh, a developer potentially would have sold to somebody, potentially take advantage. That's one of the concerns of, uh, I got most likely why that was written in the ordinance as well. Yeah, and I think, oh, pardon me for interrupting, Mr. Chairman. Um, the comment I'd make there is that, you know, in our situation, again, we're trying to go, and I appreciate you uh, noting it as well, above and beyond the, the requirement here from the acreage standpoint, but also, asking the commission to be cognizant of the uh, incredibly long gestation period for our rezone request and such, and the fact that um, in order to try to do things right and why we had this extended period since our first council vote back in June, uh, <clears throat> that we, you know, they're, they're related but they're separate in my opinion. And the fact that we don't have any interest right now, obviously, <coughs> to go back and restart the rezone of the PUD 
by adding this one acre in there, but do think that ultimately they do come together <coughs> with the knowledge that it is effectively an unmarketable piece of land, but it does have value to what we're trying to do with Northridge ultimately. So that's part of the reason you have a little bit of a disconnect right now, but also why we ask for uh, the flexibility with respect to deleting condition two as proposed by staff um, and with the amendment on condition one, because the park dedication agreement will encapsulate all that we're required to do with the full dedication of all lot 11. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Yeah, Thank you. We'll See the city engineer would like to have some comments. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, just one thing to keep in mind, so our, our subdivision ordinance is a little gray when it comes to this, uh, you know, at least one lot line has to touch uh, public right away and how we've interpreted that in the past. So you've seen through Donna's picture show there that, you know, that's been done in the past and recently we've, we've done it as a, a way to try to work with developers as they come in, uh, get them a product that they can sell, they can use, and be flexible to the extent possible within our subdivision regs. What I'm not in favor of is completely throwing out that requirement for a lot 12 that it have a, a dedicated <coughs> access easement because frankly that's just bad planning. And we need to make sure that we don't wind up in a situation, however well intended, that we have a lot that doesn't have at least some sort of permanent recorded access to it. I, I don't even think I can sign it. If a lot 12 came across my desk, no matter how you proved it, without that access easement. So, I guess the other things you can you can deliberate on, but I think there's some legal technicalities here that I don't think we can completely turn a blind eye to. Any other questions for the city engineer? Thanks, Lance. Sure. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in the audience, uh, either for or against this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll close the comment period and turn it over to commissioners for a motion, please. Mr. Chairman? Yes. First of all, I live on a street, a street or a driveway that's attached to 18th Street Southwest, the Strand Condominium. The initial planning was it was supposed to be a cul de sac and the condo was supposed to be placed the other way. They got flipped around, but the developer built two driveways, private driveways, so there was, there was access for those homes. So, I mean, have a lot that's not attached to a street. You have to provide access to it. It just makes sense. The other thing is, um, staff's concern was that subdivision regulation did not allow landlocks, landlocked lots to be planted. True or false? I'm hearing two different things tonight, but true or false? I would say on the examples that Ms. Pye showed, they were public streets, but they had driveways or some kind of access to it. In this case, there's nothing, right? I would agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With that, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't want to say there's confusion, but there's some concern. I'd like to see the outlots be treated separately. Outlot 11 be treated separately, and outlot 12 be treated separately, and I would make a motion to that effect. Is there a motion in there? Or you, that, that's my motion, yes, I'm sorry. A, mo a motion to separate the to two separate items? separate the two items, yes. Sure. Okay. Uh, got a motion to separate uh, the issues between outlaw 11 and outlaw 12. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Is there a second on the motion? Seeing no second, uh, the motion fails. Need another motion, commissioners? Motion on the floor. Is there a second, commissioners? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion, commissioners? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Barge? No. Bollinger? 
Demacus? Yes. Geiner? Yes. Hansen? Yes. Carpenko? Yes. Keller? Yes. Coop? Yes. Larchus? Yes. Wegnist? Yes. Wetzler? No. Chairman, neither. Yes. Motion carried. Okay, off to our next agenda item. Agenda item number six. Hold off as I find that, please. Agenda item number six. This is an application by Capital RV Campground for a conditional use permit and a rezoning from C2 to Ag. Turn it over to city staff for comments, please. map. Uh, this is uh, north of Capital RV Center. You'll see there built a white building with all the RVs lined up. And it is uh, <coughs> in, the, in the River Valley and in, actually down in the floodplain. It's uh, at low elevation and it's uh, in the floodplain susceptible to flooding. And uh, there, this is an aerial view of it. You can see the dead loop of the river that, that, uh, that encapsulates it, surrounds it. And you can see a trail road along the east side of the RV business that uh, has a little crossing over onto the island. That, that you'll see in a moment is the closed access to, to uh, get to the campground. The interesting thing is uh, the existing zoning, this is on commercial. I don't know if sometime in the past someone thought they were going to put a lot of fill in there <laughs> or something to make it uh, viable for commercial, but it certainly isn't at, at this time. And um, uh, the, the proposal is to put a campground in. Campgrounds aren't allowed in, in, in C2 zoning, but need to be zoned, uh, rezoned agricultural, which kind of seems like doing things backwards. Usually when something is, is uh, rezoned to a higher use, we don't want to take it back to ag. But in this case, the campground uh, makes perfect sense. Probably about the only other use it could be would be a park. There's a future land use plan that shows uh, this area is being conceptual greenway all the way across the floodplain. And that is because of the floodplain. And you'll notice uh, buyout area number two is directly adjacent to the east. So <coughs> it's certainly a, a flood prone uh, area. My understanding is that capital RV park, even though it's shown in that conceptual greenway when, when that was constructed, they brought in a significant amount of fill and uh, got it up out of the out of the floodplain. The only, uh, and this is a layout that shows a proposed access along 29th with a new uh, uh, kind of refurbished uh, crossing over the channel. Probably have to do a box culvert and get the Corps of Engineers approval on how that crossing is going to work. But there are a significant amount of trees uh, on this island, as you saw in the aerial. Hopefully, uh, a lot of those can be saved and uh, as they kind of clear cut the less desirable ones to, to save some shade. And you can see the circulation pattern is based on being able to pull through the, the sites and not have to back up. Uh, so the, the layout seems to, to work well. The only rub with this is uh, the campground in the ag zone requires a conditional use, a conditional use permit. And uh, ag zones uh, require 20 hours <coughs> generally. And so what we're proposing <coughs> as a uh, Part of the conditional approval that the minimum parcel size for this specific site for this campground be reduced to six acres to allow the campground to move forward. Uh, it's really the best use, other than if it were to be used for a park, that, that we can think of. Um, the site plan needs to be included as part of the, the conditional use permit. There's not going to be any permanent structures. Electricity will be bought, brought into the site, uh, not water and sewer. There's a development agreement required. Corps of Engineers needs to uh, approve constructing the road through the channel and whatever kind of culverts or, or whatnot would be needed. And uh, <clears throat> the final uh, location and easement to uh, get into the site has to be approved by council. 
and then the Public Works Department will figure out monthly fees for sewage disposal because there's an existing dump station at Capital RV and uh, people that use the park can go there and, and use that and so there'll be an increase in usage you'll have to figure out how to build that sewer uh, that, that sewage use and then water would be self-contained on, on the unit so uh, <coughs> that, that would be the conditions uh, I guess the one that's a little bit different is is reducing the size but in order to do this uh, and, and provide a use for this property that otherwise is in the floodplain, we feel like the conditional use, since it's for a specific use for a specific site, would be a vehicle to, to achieve that. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> Questions for city staff, commissioners? Is there anybody that would like to speak? Commissioners, my name is Sean Weeks. I'm representing the applicant. I'm Thackerman Esfold. Um, thank you for the summary, Mr. Lang. We uh, we concur with the, the approval conditions that have been set forth by staff. Um, we believe it's probably the best best use of this property that lies within the floodplain. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Questions, commissioners. So we're going to have one-way circulation on on those three loops, and entering as we cross over the dead loop, our, our access coming onto the island that'll be two-way, 24. Uh, single single way would be a 20-foot paved roadway. Well. Um, <coughs> it being within the floodplain, we are not required. We, we would have to do some additional uh, permitting if we were to impact with fill. So we're going to try to maintain the existing grade. We'll construct the road, probably dig the base, um, dig out an area and place the base and the, the, the uh, paved surface within that. So in effect, there'll be there'll be no rise. Uh, there'll be no no uh, volume consumed by what we put. Into our development. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Yeah. Yeah. So, Sean, this will have to be all self contained units that would use this campground, correct? Correct. There's no water or sewer. Right, so saying. that's right. Uh, the thought is, is the uh, Capital RV would supply water if needed, and they also have a dump station there for, um, for the black water disposal. Um, we would bring power into the site. That would be the only utility that would be extended into the property. <coughs> I'm sorry. So what we're looking at now, I think we have a total of 29. So there's about 20 that have that braided pattern. And then uh, you know, we're looking at nine or so that would be a back end arrangement. Rectangular spaces. We're going to be permitting through the Corps of Engineers and we'll coordinate with our internal uh, engineering group and water resources to make sure that there's there'll be no impact. We'll demonstrate it. You're talking fuel? Fuel, sewage, great water. Um, that is not, that is something we hadn't, hadn't considered. I guess I would view it as probably any other, any other uh, campground area we would, uh, 
I consult with Capital RV on how they'd like to, to look at handling anything of that nature. My name is Linda Victor, and I'm here representing my parents, Annalise and Ronald Roberts. <coughs> um, on this map, you can't see, but they live at the corner of 14th Avenue and what the city um, uh, plays around with 29th Street Southwest. They use it for their benefit when it benefits them and they get rid of it when that benefits them. So if you can see they, Ronald and Annalise Roberts, if you go back to that last map that shows the red that's zone commercial, that one right there. Okay, they own the property that's in red, right there at the 14th and what some places have it as 29th Street. Um, I believe it's, is that Bob, the principal, or Wally, the principal planner that was introducing this? What is your name? Uh, no, Lance Lang. Lance Lang, okay. <coughs> he called it a trail. And then it was later called a street. And Ronald and Annalise Roberts owned the easement to that street. They were never sent a letter about this meeting. Um, and Capital RV is planning on using that to get to their supposed campground. Um, and I would like to know who owns that island that they're proposing the campground on because everything that we've looked at, Capital RV, is been delinquent on their taxes for that island. Um, as of last year. Um, and it, rumor has it, uh, the, the appraiser for um, City of Minot and CDM Smith said that they gifted that island to the city of Minot. There, at, before the HUD approved for the buyout of that neighborhood came through, the levy that was planned to be put there would have covered what is 29th Street and part of Capital RV and it would have protected the whole neighborhood. When they applied for the grant and received the grant, we went in to buy out. That leaves Capital RV there and takes uh, over 55 year old neighborhood away. When City of Minot, the, all those properties, those rear, the east side lots, the east side of 29th Street, all the way down to the river. When, when they did the appraisal, they told all those people that own those east side lots, 
that their properties were worth less money because they had no access to their properties. And we were told also that once that's a green zone, that, that it can't be used for a business. And I'm having a real problem with their bringing this, you know, asking to do this after everybody's been made to go into a buyout. You know, they, they, they were made to build that up to be out of the flood zone after the flood. And we would have never been flooded in that neighborhood. We were not flooded in 69. We were not flooded in 76 because there was a levee that ran along the west side of the golf course from the top and to the river. And what they're calling 29th Street was also a levee. We never got flooded. In 2009, somebody bought all the lots along the west side of the golf course, tore the levee down, and that's why we all got flooded in that neighborhood. I'm still trying to find out who allowed that to happen. I understand um, this committee, this commission has no, um, not a lot of, uh, I guess, bearing over where the buyouts go and, and, and to your comments. I, I don't think that, that this is the place for that discussion because we don't handle the buyout situation. So, um, but I will try to answer some of your questions really quick. And, and if Mr. Ackerman can, I'm sorry, if Mr. Weeks can help me um, as well. Uh, the road, who owns the road at the current time? <coughs> Please approach. So if, if we're making reference to 29th, it's a platted right-of-way, so it would have been okay. owned and maintained by the, dedicated to the city of Minot. City of Minot. Okay, and then the parcel is owned by the applicant at this time? It is. Subject property? Correct. Thank you very much. Please, please continue. Okay, so the, we own the easement to the 29th Street. I've got the paperwork right here. <coughs> It's, we a platted, own, it's a platted right of way at this time. Who platted it? The city of Minot would have platted it. <laughs> and they don't notify the person who owns the parcel? Maybe we could have um, uh, Lance, the city engineer, speak to, to that, uh, to your question. Well, Lance Lang, that's you, right? Oh, I'm Lance Meyer. Not two Lances. Okay, but Lance Lang deemed by he he spoke with the appraiser, Jorge Pagan, at the appraisal time and deemed two parcels of property that my parents own. Mm -hmm. I have them right here if you'd like to look at them. And he deemed them undevelopable, okay? Well, I need somebody to explain to me the one parcel is at the corner of 28th Street and 14th Avenue. And there was always a trailer on there before the flood. After the flood, my parents' FEMA trailer was on there. It has water, sewer, electric. The other parcel that runs from uh, just the, the property line on the east side to the telephone pole that's, that Capital RV's campers are hanging over if that he deemed that undevelopable and now you're going to develop it into a roadway how, how can you <coughs> say it's undevelopable and then develop it into a roadway i guess i can't speak to the, the, the appraiser that came out and 
uh, appraiser adjusted your, your property for the bio process. I can't speak to that. Um, but maybe we can get some clarification on the roadway for you from our uh, city engineer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, so what I believe uh, she's referring to is there looks to be a sliver of land that uh, kind of bisects this, uh, yeah, this uh, 29th Street and may cut that off. We'd have to go back through records and verify what's going on there. Okay. But uh, the rest of 29th Street, north, south, does exist except for it's probably its termination right at what would be 14th Avenue. Okay. Thank you. So before, um, I guess before uh, approval, we would look into that traffic study, et cetera? Yeah. Correct. You know, and, and so if you'll read in your, and some of the conditions of approval, the, the applicant's going to need a little help from us on getting access to that property. Just because of where that existing, call it causeway or access road is, um, it's technically on a city minor parcel. So I think at the end of the day here, um, you know, well, I think the use is, is just fine and it would be expected in a, in a floodplain like this, having a, like a primitive campground. In order to get there, they're gonna have to have a, an access easement from us through a city minor parcel that we've acquired to get there. So. That's why some of that language that's in there about developer agreements and, and access and those sort of things are, are part of that condition because if we can't get that worked out, then we can't allow this other stuff to happen. So there's a lot of moving parts with this one. Thank you. Any other questions for the city engineer? Okay. Chief, did you have some more comments? Well, I don't know. I guess my name is William Roberts, Linda's my sister, and getting back to this, I guess I'd just request the council that uh, most likely pending legal ramifications that this be put on a back burner and no decision be made today. Until the buyout is done. Until the buyout's complete okay. for that area. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions? questions all right hearing none uh, we'll close the public hearing interpret over turn it over to the commissioners for a motion um, Kelly uh, city attorney would you care to make any comment to the uh, to the uh, I guess the uh, comments of the applicant I'm sorry the uh, opposition mr. chairman the Commission always has the option to hold an item it's up to the Commission this does go to City Council if it's approved or, or the recommendation is to approve, or the recommendation is to deny, the council has the final determination. So it could also be held at the city council level. Um, Perfect. Those are your options. Yep, thank you. Um, turn it over to the commissioners for a motion, please. Make a motion to hold the item. Too many moving parts. Okay. We have a motion on the floor second. and a second. Any other comments? Discussion? Call the roll, please. Barch? Yes. Bullinger? Yes. Geiner? No. Hansen? Yes. Carpenko? Yes. Keller? Yes. Coop? Yes. Larsis? Yes. Wignes? Yes. Wetzler? No. Chairman, neither. No. Motion carries to hold. Mr. Name, sorry. <laughs> the motion still carries to hold the item. On to our next item, uh, item agenda item number seven. This is an application by um, Capital RV Center Incorporated, um, I guess, to uh, replat lots A, B, and C about lot 30 of section 27, 155, 83. With that, uh, city staff, can we hear some comments, please? Yes, sir. This is a vicinity map of the south side of Highway 2 and 52, right across from where Bird Expressway West comes out to the highways. That is currently zoned commercial. Oh, uh, here's a photography map. Um, you can see there's a lot of topo that were that is uh, in existence there, 
especially on the south side and then wrapping around uh, to the to the north. And uh, in this particular slide, you're you're looking with north facing up, but this orthographic view is, is from looking from the north back to the to the south, basically from the opposite direction. But it really illustrates the the hill on the south and east side. Then there's a nice flat area, basically, and then uh, it drops off on the north west side uh, down uh, even further. So find the RV. <coughs> it's zone C2, and there's no request to rezone it to anything different. You can see there's uh, quite a bit of commercial um, <coughs> along the established Prudder Road, Prudder Road Elk Drive that uh, serves the lots along the south side there. The land use, future land use map shows it uh, to be uh, it's in conformance uh, with commercial zoning and a lot of commercial designations around it. Here's the plat itself, three lots, three commercial lots. So staff recommendations are for approval. The development agreement requires stormwater management needs to be worked out. Drainage to the NDOT uh, right away needs to be approved and also a traffic study by the city and uh, the Department of Transportation Engineers. The improvements will be obligated to be installed by the developer and there's some work needs to be done on Elk Drive from Sundown Drive East uh, to provide urban road standards either through special assessment district agreement with adjacent property owners or the developer of West Acres Business Center themselves. So if you have any questions. Thank you Mr. Lang. Uh, any, any questions for city staff on this application? Seeing none, uh, is there anybody that would like to speak in favor of this application? <coughs> Sean Weeks again with Ackman Esfold representing the applicant. Uh, <coughs> we again concur with staff recommendations. Uh, one thing I would like to note is we have a typo on our preliminary plat. The width of the access easement is not 66, it's 40 feet. So that'll be clarified and, and adjusted with the, with the final plat. We'll s still. Uh, that would be the, the, the hash area of this? Correct. So lot one and lot two will interface, and 20 feet on each side of that would be the, uh, the full width of the access easement. Thank you. Yeah, Any problems with that? Okay. I had a question. Uh, where, on item five, where it says that there'll be improvements made on the road uh, through special assessments um, or by the developer, what if the people say, no, we don't want to be special assessed? Well, how the, the assessment policy reads <laughs> is 51% of the the group considered for the assessment protested, then it would <coughs> fail, then it, then it would not occur. Um, part of our thinking was that uh, it would be to everyone's benefit along that roadway to have it improved. Um, for them to uh, distribute the cost would clearly be to their benefit as well. So um, our hope is that they'll be on board with it. I guess my question is, is that it says either or type thing here, and yet if those people who've been living up there all this time and they're just happy with the road, and uh, I'm not objection to what you're doing, but if that's part of the right path, so then maybe not want to. So, it. Mr. Wetzler, this will, uh, we don't expect that there's going to be any residential input on this. This will be all commercial okay. along Elk. and it would be to their benefit to have a, uh, a paved roadway. Any other questions, commissioners? So one item just to forward on to the applicant, uh, Mr. Weeks, would be, um, I think I saw a semi-trailer in the uh, front of this property, is that correct? A advertising? Correct, yeah. Yes. And, uh, section 22-4 prohibits uh, signs and on semi-trailers uh, for, for that type of use, so. Duly noted, and I will, I will relate that to Mr. Benz. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? 
Seeing none, um, is, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak in opposition of this application? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and turn it over to commissioners for a motion. Need a motion, commissioners. Got a motion on the floor. Do I hear a second? Second. Any other discussion? Call the roll, please. Barge. Yes. Bollinger. Yes. Demacus. Geiner, yep. Hansen, yep. Karpenko, yep. Keller, yep. Coop, yes. Larchus, yes. Wigness, yes. Wetzler, yes. Chairman Neither. Yes. Motion carries. Um, on other business, uh, item number eight. Uh, this is notice um, that we'll be having a hearing today um, for the uh, adoption of the changes in amending the Minot zone. Zoning code and ordinance. Mr. Lang, take it away. Yes, sir. Uh, you recall last meeting, uh, we did a dog and pony show with some slides about changes to the landscape ordinance. And uh, that was mostly kind of uh, show some concepts and our approach at comparing the existing ordinance to the proposed changes. And uh, one of the slides that we showed at that time was this one. And, uh, would you rather live in the community on the left or the right? You know, see a concrete or a reasonable amount of landscaping. And what we think we've been able to achieve in working with the steering committee is a reduction in the required quantities and sizes of the plants that still maintain uh, an attractive landscape, uh, streetscape and, and commercial and, uh, development areas, primary commercial, but also multifamily and, and industrial and whatnot. And we've done that through the breaking uh, the landscaping into component areas. Just a couple of quick comments. Uh, this is basically a, a total rewrite. This isn't a strikeout underline. There's no version that we took one sentence out and added a paragraph. This is a totally new approach. Uh, there was a developer's forum that was held where developers were invited to meet with staff and talk about you know, what things were doing right, but what issues they have, things that are not going as well. And uh, zoning came to the forefront, and landscaping was probably the number one. Uh, there's about three things in zoning. Landscaping was certainly one of those three that uh, they felt like needed to be revised. So, as a response to their concerns, uh, we've we've developed this proposal. I'm going to run through this real quick in summary fashion, <coughs> and if you have any any questions, certainly uh, ask me at the end. So the components are uh, six of them. Streetscape parking lot, building foundation, loading and service areas, buffer yards, and then what we call supplemental landscaping. There's no crossover between the components except for the supplemental. In other words, the, they're standalone. What required of the streetscape is different than what's required of the parking lot. And if there's a formula, for example, to figure out how many trees are required for the buffer yard, you can't carry that formula over to some other area. The only exception is the supplemental landscape because it does cross over. That apply to parking lot islands, interior parking lot, uh, building foundation plantings, and then street yards for vehicle sales, which is kind of a special exemption that we'll talk about here in a minute. So on the right side of the screen is kind of a commercial, a typical commercial development with the building parked in front. It's on a corner lot with two streets. And uh, so we start out with the first component, street yard. Along this particular example, most streets uh, would, would be required to have a landscape strip 10 feet wide from the property line into the into the site, uh, planted with grass or other approved plantings. We, we don't want rock out there. Um, and then there are supplemental plantings that are required again for uh, special exemption for vehicle sales that we'll talk about here in a minute. The second component is within that 10 foot strip, there's a tree for every 50 lineal feet on all the streets. There's no discount for driveways. You measure from one end of the, of the uh, street quarter of the street, uh, length of the street to the other. And so if it's 200 feet, you divide that by 50, you need four trees. The one for 50 establishes the quantity, not the spacing. So if those four trees are the requirement, then they can be slid over. So there's two on one end, two on the other, three on at one end, one on the other, provides a lot of design flexibility. The trees have to be one and a half inch caliper minimum size. Current ordinance is two and a half inch, so there's a cost savings that's significant there. 
have to be deciduous canopy trees unless there's overhead utilities, which uh, then or mill trees would be okay. And here's a 50% reduction for vehicle sales. Because uh, those types of businesses that sell new and used vehicles and boats and RVs and that kind of thing rely on outdoor display of inventory and hopefully that inventory looks nice and clean and attractive. Uh, those owners don't particularly care for trees. First of all, because they say, you know, they block the inventory, but also because of leaves and sap and insects and things like that. So we're proposing that for those types of uses, they can have a 50% reduction in the street tree requirement, but in order to do so, they're subject to supplemental landscaping. A couple of slides I showed last time on the left, newly planted trees, <coughs> new installation. I think you can certainly see through there and see what's going on. But again, remember, they don't have to be evenly spaced, so these four trees can be slid two to the end, two to the end, you'd have a wide open view. As, uh, as you go to a mature landscaping, at the pedestrian or driver's level, you can certainly see under the canopy and see what's going on. So really the reduction is more to reduce impact to the cars with sap and everything than to, to uh, get around trying to you know hide the, the cars, because I think that there's certainly opportunities for views. And then uh, for street guard, uh, for sh shrubs are required for large parking lots over 100 spaces, one shrub for 10 lineal feet, uh, planted in groupings in that 10 foot strip. That, that wouldn't be the case for the cars because they have to do the supplemental landscaping. Uh, now, the second component is parking lots. That's interior parking lot and there's perimeter parking lot. So in the interior, 20 square feet of landscaping for each parking space. Has to have a curb and gutter around it containing an island or a median or a corner. Anything that juts out into the parking lot that's going to be landscaped. Minimum width has to be 8 feet. Minimum size 100. So if you did the minimum at 8 feet, that would be 12 and a half. But if you think of a bookend island at the end of a row of parking, end-to-end -end cars would be 20 and 20, so you'd have 40 feet by 80, or by 8, so 320 square feet. One deciduous canopy tree per island, one and a half inch minimum size. There's, there's no tree, there's no credit. I got my flagpole, I got my light pole. Well, it doesn't count then. Got to put a tree in it. And then they're subject to supplemental landscaping that we'll talk about. My clicker's ticking. Uh, in some cases, a developer or designer might want to, instead of doing like five smaller islands, just do one large island that might in fact help with snow removal. So in that case, for islands exceeding 300 square feet, you have to plant an inch and a half caliper tree for every 300 square feet and subject to supplemental landscaping. There's an exemption for M1 <coughs> and M2 industrial development unless it's developed as a commercial use type. Perimeter plantings, we have the street trees we already talked about if the parking lot happens to be along the street. Uh, we also talked about greater than 100 spaces, you have shrubs. In, in, in a unique situations where the parking lot sits higher than the street, we require screening so that the headlight light lights aren't shining into the, <coughs> the uh, vehicles. Residential use, if it's a commercial parking lot against residential, there's a 20 foot wide buffer yard required. If that use is across an alley or street, it can be reduced to 10 feet with a a screen for the headlights again, and the visibility triangle needs to be honored. Component three is foundation perimeter plantings around the building, all street facing facades, so on a corner lot, it would be two, two facades. The depth is four feet, the existing ordinance requires six, plus wrapping around the building 10 feet, so this is reduced. And supplemental plantings are required, exemptions M1 and M2. Maybe this clicker just doesn't want to. Uh, component four is loading and service. The back, the back uh, door areas of commercial development typically have things such as outdoor storage of in inventory, uh, cardboard balers, and those kind of things. And those items need to be screened from view, with visible, visible from a public street or residential properties with an opaque barrier, not less than six feet in height. So options on what type of screening that could be. No chain link with slats in it. Refuse collection containers are the second component. They either need to be inside a gated enclosure that mimics the principal structure, and we've heard a lot of complaints about the cost that adds. So the other uh, option would be to screen it with plant material.
buffer yards. They are not required in every case, only where there's a more intensive use next to a less intensive use. So classic example is commercial or industrial next to residential. 20 foot wide continuous strip along the property line planted to grass. Uh, it's intended to be green space, so no paving, outdoor storage, no loose rock. That can be crossed with intermittent <coughs> access drives. One tree for every 20 lineal feet. We tried to make the math real simple. And at least 50% of those trees have to be conifers, which are evergreen trees because they provide year-round <coughs> screening and at least five feet tall. Then the other 50%, per designer's preference, could also be conifers, so you'd have 100%, or it could be 50% deciduous or ornamental or shrubs along with the conifers. And shrubs would be valued at five shrubs per tree. Note that shrubs for trees is not permitted for other component types. You can't use shrubs for street trees, for example. There is, uh, in cases where a street or alley separates the adjacent properties or an industrial use is next to commercial, a reduction of 50% to a 10 foot wide buffer yard, a six foot height to the fence is required on the inside or the outside, 100% compact upright conifers in one tree every 10 lineal feet. There are reasons for that formula and I will explain to them to anybody that wants to ask me outside of the meeting. So the component uh, six is the supplemental thing. And it, it applies to parking lot islands, building foundation plantings, and it, it applies if a vehicle sales type of use gets a street tree exemption, but that's not a categorical exclusion that in order to offset not having the trees, they have to plant other growies. And so this really kind of came about as a discussion about rock, and, and uh, everybody likes to put in rock because it's readily available and it doesn't move and it's easy to maintain. And rock by itself doesn't really meet the intent of landscaping, but if we put landscaping plants with the rock, <coughs> then uh, then that that's that's a good thing. So the way it works is uh, there's a there's a, a formula. So whatever the square footage of the area is to be landscaped times five divided by 100 is the total number of plants. So in this example, 15 foot wide bed, 58 feet long is 870 square feet. You do the math, 44 plants, right? But in order to assure there's some diversity and, uh, and uh, some design flexibility, we want to make sure they're not 44 or all the same kind of plants. So there's five plant categories here that we apply a multiplier to each category. This math is really easy, believe me. So for large shrubs, 5% of them have to be, so that's two of them, two shrubs. For perennials, drop down to there, 25% of 44 plants is 11. You total all those plants up, there's 25 plants out of the 44 that are pre-designated so that we ensure that we have diversity. The remainder of the 19 plants are designer's choice. So again, it gives a lot of flexibility to the designer to, to do what they'd like to do. And we're on the home stretch here, folks. These are just general requirements towards the end. There's landscape plan and plant risk required. There's plant diversity, uh, restricted species. Sizes are important because, you know, bigger sizes cost more money. We reduced the canopy trees and ornamental trees from two and a half to one and a half. We reduced the conifer trees from six to five. Then there's the section on substitution of species, inorganic materials, installation conflicts. What if I can't plant the tree where it shows on the plan? Visibility clearance, maintenance, <coughs> watering, pruning, fertilizing, whatnot. Timing and enforcement, we're proposing uh, some kind of financial vehicle like a letter of credit or a bond or something if the landscaping, or if the building's occupied in the winter and the landscaping go kick the wind, so we have assurances that'll happen. And we're working with the Minot Park District on a list of recommended prohibited trees. At this time, there's some pluses and minuses to that. That would not not be written into the ordinance. It, if we decide to do it, it'd be like a handout that would be available through the Park District and the Planning Department. So that's it, quick run through. The different components, the math on each one. Um, we did take this through the steering committee. I'd like to thank them for their input as well as the uh, developers forum. And we actually sent an invite to those folks to come and I don't know if they did. But uh, as a follow up to the outcome of that, or their concerns with landscape. Thank you very much, Mr. Lang. Uh, is there any discussion from the commissioners on this item? Any questions for city staff? This is a public hearing, so anybody out here can speak. Mr. Ackerman? Yes. 
Good, e good evening again. Um, on behalf of the steering committee, I'd like to thank uh, the staff. Obviously, they put in a tremendous amount of time, uh, put up with the steering committee comments. Uh, we, where we started and where we ended up was, was uh, we went a long ways. Uh, obviously, Chairman Ether, uh, Commissioner Keller, uh, Alderman Sittman was also involved in the conversation. So uh, I'd certainly recommend you guys uh, uh, moving this forward on the first reading. Thank you. That's correct. And we reduced the quantities and sizes, uh, and we, I think, provided more straightforward math to, to calculate things, so it should be easier for people to figure out. It may seem overwhelming when I run through all the 15 minutes, but if, if logically you can separate those components out and do the math on each one and add them all together, so developers should know what they're is being expected and designers should be able to figure it out. We think it's a better, better deal. Thank you for those comments. With that, I'll close the public hearing and turn it over to commissioners for a motion. Barge. Yes. Bollinger. Demacus. Yes. Geiner. Guess he's gone. <laughs> uh, Hansen. Carpenko. Yes. Keller. Coop. Yes. Larsius. Yes. Wagnus. Yes. Wetzler. Yes. Chairman Neither. Yes. Motion carried. Uh, last item on tonight's agenda in other business is number nine uh, presentation. Uh, by on behalf of uh, CDM Smith for the affordable housing study and decisioning support tool. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was asked by uh, Mr. Zakin to do the introductions. Oh, please. Uh, we have here with us uh, two representatives from CDM Smith, uh, Melissa Ziegler and <coughs> Stephen Wilsfeld. They'll do. Uh, they'll be doing two separate presentations. As you know, we have a seventy-four million grant from the National Disaster Resilience uh, Effort, and uh, they encompass 16 projects. Uh, two of those projects are complete, or I would say near complete. The uh, decision support tool is, is a pretty innovative project to kind of help us look at our mitigation, flood mitigation efforts, and, and uh, we also have the, uh, an update of our affordable housing study. <coughs> as you probably were aware, just right after the flood and right during the oil boom, there was a affordable housing study completed, but since then, the market conditions have changed dramatically. So Melissa Ziegler is gonna to speak to that, and then Steve uh, Wilson will speak to the decision support tool. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Steve Wolfsfeld with CDM Smith. Um, thanks for inviting me here tonight. This is just more of an informational uh, summary um, just to discuss the decision support tool that we, we've been working on as part of the uh, National Disaster Resiliency Competition. Um, basically, the overview of the model um, is uh, we took a holistic look at the entire uh, Suris River um, watershed basin. Um, basically, what we did is we, we built on the hydraulic and uh, hydrologic uh, model that was put together for the flood control project. We built on that and uh, we overlaid some uh, ideas and some operational um, modifications to dams in the, at uh, Lake Darling and the three uh, Canadian reservoirs take a look at potential ways to uh, reduce uh, flood risk in Minot and also implement some potential uh, water management strategies. Uh, this is a um, kind of a nodal look at the model itself. Uh, you can see um, Alameda Reservoir, Raftery Reservoir, and the Boundary Reservoir and their associated dams up in, uh, up in the Canadian province. Um, we looked at that down through uh, just north of here, Lake Darling. Um, up in the Upper Soros um, uh, Wildlife Refuge, 
Uh, we looked at some potential modifications there, and then down through Minot, and uh, eventually downstream at the uh, Jay Cark. Uh, it's all your uh, wildlife refuges as well. The impacts down there to what are to what our alternatives uh, put forth. Uh, in addition to supporting the grant application, uh, the, the overarching project goals um, were uh, prioritization of the buyouts in support of the, uh, in support of the flood control project, take a look at where, where would be the most beneficial place to focus on the initial <coughs> buyouts. Um, we also looked at, uh, worked with the engineers on some potential uh, cost reduction measures uh, in a couple locations um, that paid some nice dividends. And then uh, finally, we looked at operational enhancements at the dams, at the, uh, the three Canadian reservoirs, and the Lake Darling Reservoir. Um, as far as the process uh, for the tool itself, um, we took, we used the existing models that were in place, so that was really nice. The models um, that used for the flood control project were fantastic. Uh, we built on those, and we overlaid um, a lot of alternatives. Basically what, what, what the tool allows you to do is to look at hundreds and hundreds of alternatives um, very quickly to assess uh, the ramifications of making certain modifications and, and how the impacts are upstream and downstream within the, uh, within the entire watershed. So you can see here, um, these are the three main alternatives that we kind of boiled it down to. Um, the first alternative is is modifying the dam operations at Lake Darling. Um, and, and the basic gist uh, of what, what we looked at there <coughs> was, is, is there benefit during a, a large flood event to having dam operations push a little more water earlier, you know, pre-flood, push a little more water downstream, opening up storage in that reservoir, um, which would lower the peaks that you see in Minot during a 100-year or greater flood event. Um, uh, that was the first alternative. Second was doing similar uh, modification operations for uh, the three Canadian reservoirs. Um, those, alternative one and alternative two are zero cost alternatives. So there's more interest in those alternatives um, looking at the operational modification than there was in alternative three, which is actually doing structural modifications to the, uh, to the dam at Lake Darling. Um, making structural modification, I think it was, a, it was about an 80, 90 million dollar project to allow um, a five foot raise in the storage elevation at the reservoir. Uh, you can see here, here's the results of, uh, of the alternatives we looked at. The baseline, the baseline peak is the blue, uh, the blue graph line there. Um, when you implement alternative one, which is just modifying the operations of the dam at Lake Darling during a flood event, uh, I brought the peak down about a foot and a half in the city of Minot during, a, during a, you know, looking back at the 2011 flood. Um, it took a lot of, it took a lot of hundreds and hundreds of runs to, to get, you know, to find the sweet spot um, w with modifying the operations, but it pays dividends. Um, alternative two, uh, you can see the gray line there. Um, if you can get um, operations modified in the three Canadian reservoirs, along with modifying the Lake Darling operations, it really pays dividends. The, uh, the, the, the peak, uh, peak flood elevation is almost a uh, three and a half foot, would be a three and a half foot reduction over the 2011, uh, uh, the 2011 uh, crest elevation that you saw. Uh, so once, once, these once these alternatives were flushed out, refined, um, over the course of uh, you know, weeks and weeks of modeling here, um, we, we, we put uh, cost to it. Um, how, how much uh, flood impact was saved, um, that, that increases the benefit. We looked at that versus the cost to see what happens to the benefit cost ratio when you implement these alternatives. Um, and we did that using the uh, FEMA has this model. Um, and then finally, there's a quality control step um, where we compared our results back to the uh, uh, flood control project model just to make sure that everything was in line and all the numbers checked out um, with respect to flows and peaks and that type of thing. 
Um, so here's the uh, a summary of what happened to the benefit cost numbers uh, with each of the alternatives. The top number is uh, the flood control project itself. Um, checked out at about a 1.5 benefit to cost ratio, meaning there's, for every one and a half, do one and a half dollars of avoided flood impacts, you spend a dollar on the flood control project, which is a fantastic uh, ratio in and, above, in and above itself. Um, you do some, you overlay some targeted buyouts on there, and uh, which, which we use the tool to do, um, and you jack up the benefit cost ratio to about 1.6. Um, Furthermore, you, you overlay modifications to Lake Darling, modifications to the operations of the dam there during an event, um, and you overlay potentially the uh, modifying the operations at the Canadian reservoirs, and you get that uh, benefit cost ratio <coughs> up to 1.7 and 2.3. So you can see there's tremendous value if uh, we can get these organizations to buy into modifying how they operate the dams during, uh, uh, during large-scale flood events. So how will the tool be used in the future? Um, like I just said, the operational guidance at the, uh, um, at the Lake Darling Reservoir and the three Canadian reservoirs would, be, uh, would offer a tremendous amount of value. Um, I would <coughs> use the tool to continue with uh, targeted buyouts as the flood control project progresses in the, over the next several years. Um, uh, Fish and Wildlife, that's, uh, that, that's Lake Darling. Um, We've had preliminary discussions with them, and they are interested in, uh, in, in talking and using the tool to further take a look at some of the operational modifications. Um, the Joint Board, U.S. Army Corps, uh, Cinnaboyne Group, um, these, uh, we're open to sharing this tool and using this tool with all of these various organizations. If they want to take a look at uh, model simulations, if they want to look at alternatives, uh, we can quickly run hundreds and hundreds of scenarios with this tool. It's all set up and ready to go. So uh, the use of this tool is open to, uh, to any of these organizations. So we welcome City of Minot, working with them to, uh, to take a look at uh, uh, using the tool going forward. Um, so that just kind of gives a brief, uh, a brief summary of the tool and where we're at and the progress that we've made and the value that we think it's brought the city. Um, at that point, we'll have uh, have any questions that you may have? Any questions, commissioners? One quick question I have is the variables that you can essentially play with, get your, get your hands on the, on the handles, uh, does that include uh, different amounts of rainfall at different, Absolutely. different regions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we modeled um, uh, the 100 year and the, uh, the flood record in 2011. Okay. Take a look at, to take a look at these numbers. But yeah, if you want to run a 10 year, 50 year, you can run anything you want very quickly. Are the, uh, are the Canadian agencies on board with this at, at this time, or because um, uh, the, the best benefit is to have all three of three absolutely. and Darling all work together? Yeah, that, that's a work in progress. I think that's going to take some effort um, to get these groups together and work together uh, to do that. But uh, we're armed with the model. We're armed with the uh, um, with the results of the model. And, uh, We'd be more than happy to facilitate ongoing discussions with any of the agencies because the value's there. The value's there. It's a fantastic first step to get them to the table, have a tool available. So thank yeah. you for your, your time and effort. Yeah, thank you. Yep. zipping through right now so that um, we can all go home. Um, one of the things that we were asked to do is to develop um, a way to evaluate resilience um, in Minot, uh, looking at various single family residential um, developable acreage within the, within the city. And this map is a map of um, vacant residentially zoned property in the city of Mahana. Um, it, it was uh, completed in 2016. You see that there's a fair number of, um, a fair amount of inventory in single family residential lots. 
So we went through a process quickly of, of looking at what were the factors that people in my not thought were contributed to resilience. We used a series of, of ArcGIS um, tools and some other evaluation um, methodologies. And these resilience features came out of the 70 public meetings that we had during the uh, national, the NDR project application process. People were interested in a range of housing densities, access to transit, linking up to trails, which you've had some discussion about tonight, um, smart growth principles. So what we've done is to develop um, a series of filters that we can um, automate using GIS, um, look at proximity filters, um, We identified also, when I showed you that map just a second ago that had all the vacant property, we discovered that there's a lot of, of that vacant property that, that shows up on the mapping. Uh, really was um, drainage ways, uh, ponds, things of that nature. So anything you see here on, in black on this map is property that we took out. I wanted to show you really quickly. So you, this particular uh, parcel outlined in red, you see that sort of funny looking um, block property, we see that that's a drainage way that runs through a subdivision. So we took all of that property out and we were left with uh, 23 existing um, flatted subdivisions in Minot that have um, a fair number of vacant residential properties. Um, so we've gone through a process working with the city uh, planning staff and with the, the city staff to develop a set of proximity filters and uh, a methodology for ranking and rating and scoring all these different sites. Um, other developers and property owners are going to contribute um, sites that they might want to have evaluated. Um, if anybody wants a copy of this presentation, we'll be happy to get one to you. Um, and uh, in case you'd like to look at this more closely, there's a whole series of maps for every single one of those 23 different subdivisions that you just saw. <coughs> but we've looked at um, the proximity to transit to trails, to schools, um, to commercial areas, so that we can look at more walkable communities and all the different features and factors uh, that people in the community said were important. Uh, if you'd like to know more about this process, it's a workable uh, model and tool, and we have a, an RFP that the city will be releasing on Wednesday of this week to uh, identify potential sites for the city's first a resilient neighborhood development uh, for single family housing in Maya. And we'll use this process um, as part of the evaluation process. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If you would like a copy of the supply and demand analysis and you want to read all 120 pages, it's very data intensive. Um, it's on the city's website, but we'll be happy to send you a copy. And with that, I'll be happy to answer questions. Any questions, Commissioner? The first step uh, this Wednesday, I guess, would be to uh, identify which, I guess, narrow down the properties, these 23, and then is this, are we going to choose three sites, or what, what, what is the process look the, like? The RFP on Wednesday that will come out will give uh, property owners in Mono the opportunity to submit sites and properties to be evaluated um, if they're interested in participating in the single family program. And then once uh, a site is I guess designated, what's, what are the next steps? What, what takes place at that time? At that point, we have a homeownership incentive program that will also be rolled out <coughs> by the city council uh, in their October meeting. And um, the plan is in May of, of 2018 to begin construction on some a small number of uh, new single family residences in Minot we've been working with, um, with, the workers, <coughs> with lenders in the community, and others, uh, we want to make sure that we have a small enough um, inventory of new homes as to not conflict with existing home resales. Um, the program with the single family, uh, with the single family uh, home ownership incentive will also be available to uh, qualified home buyers uh, for existing resale homes as well. So there'll be some more information about that after city council reads it. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your time. I do not believe we need a motion on item number nine, informational. Uh, anything else to go to the order, commissioners? I need a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. 
And a second? All in favor say aye.